Good evening, everyone. My name is Wendy Maldonado D'Amico. I am Yale College class of 1993. I was in uh, TD and I am a member of the YAA Board of Governors. Um, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Careers Life in Yale Committee, um, which produces the show that you are uh, in right now. So every Thursday night, Careers Life in Yale hosts um, an 8 p.m. program uh, featuring different aspects of alumni life. Um, and sometimes we include students as well. And we rotate those topics um, among four different channels, we call them. And one of those channels is called uh, Life and Personal Growth. And that is the channel that we are featuring tonight. Uh, so as uh, we talk this evening, I just wanna give a, a little preview of kind of what to expect. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker and moderator in just a moment. They're going to speak for about uh, half an hour or so between the two of them. While they are speaking, we would ask that you remain muted. Um, but after they're done chatting, uh, we do invite all of you to submit questions um, in the chat and I will look at those questions and call on different people to ask their questions of our, our guest speaker this evening. Um, so you'll be able to come off mute, just raise your hand, come off mute if I call on you and you can ask your question. But the, the latter half of the event is meant to be interactive so that you can um, talk to our guest speaker and, and ask her some questions and, and share some of your own experiences. So we're looking forward to tonight and your participation. We're so, so thrilled you are here. Um, so first, up. I'm so delighted to, uh, to introduce these two amazing Yaleys to you. Uh, first up, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, Tammy Luchow, class of 1992. So she was the year ahead of me. Um, Tammy is a lifetime advocate and change maker for people with visible and invisible disabilities and their families. As an undergrad, Tammy worked to raise awareness for causes connected to people with disabilities on campus and beyond. She then continued her work as a journalist at NBC News, Nightly News, Dateline NBC, and MSNBC's headlines, Headliners and Legends. Tammy is a disability, equity, inclusion, and belonging consultant, as well as a speaker and a writer. Her work was featured in 201 Magazine. Tammy's focus is always on making sure that people with disabilities have a seat at the table, even when that table may need some accessibility. She rides, resides in New Jersey with her husband and children. And then I would like to introduce our featured speaker for this evening, Arena Ferguson, who is a graduate of the Divinity School class of 2010. Arena is a marketing and communications manager for an ed tech company. She is a TEDx curator and a special needs advocate. Her memoir, My Good Life, was featured as Thrive Global Must Reads in 2020. Her recent monologue, Listen to Her, was read by actress Marla Gibbs and was featured at Waco Theater's 50 and 50 event. She has been featured on CNBC, NBC Universal, Afrotech, LA Parents Magazine, Black Enterprise, and the LA Times. She is currently a YAA at-large delegate and the YAA social media Eli ambassador, one of the Eli ambassadors. Irena lives in North Carolina with her husband and children. And now I would like to turn it over to our moderator and guest speaker. Take it away. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you, Kate behind the scenes for all your help. Thank you to the Careers Life in Yale for presenting this program and having a space for this conversation. Mm -hmm. I would like to welcome all of you as alums, members of the Yale family, and, and I am excited to have all of you meet Arena. Arena is an incredible woman who I had the pleasure of having a conversation that we both thought would take I don't know, half an hour, maybe an hour. And at the two hour mark, we realized, uh oh, we had some other commitments and we didn't know where the time went. So tonight, the hardest thing I think will be to keep 
the conversation flowing because Arena is so full of incredible stories, incredible life lessons. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at her book, her book is called, as, as Wendy just said, My Good Life. And it talks about the ups and downs, the highs and lows of her life, raising a, a daughter with special needs and in some ways raising herself. And mm -hmm. the Yale community was part of that. And for those of you who've read it, I'm, I can already, I can speak for myself and say your powerful, insightful and heartwarming stories are throughout the book arena. And tonight I'm just really excited for you to share some bits and pieces of your experience. I see you, you've got your Yale shirt on and that's fabulous. And it's the perfect start for me to ask you if you could give us a sense of what life was like for you. Well, I, I know you had you have degrees from a lot of universities and mm -hmm. you've learned and have life, life lessons from all over this country. But for tonight, if you would tell us a little bit about how Yale featured into your journey and how your insights or your struggles um, about at life at Yale really impacted you and your story because my good life is just such an important story to tell. And I'm thankful that you're here to share it with us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tammy. And your story is amazing as well, which I look forward to hearing. So, um, so much about your story resonates with me as a parent of a child um, with a disability and just all that we navigated. So thank you for, ha for having me and moderating. My time at Yale was amazing. If I'm honest, anyone who knows me on social media can see that I enjoyed my time at Yale. And so, yes, it was my second master's and it, it was amazing. But I, I want to like rewind a little bit to tell you how I got there. So I actually was a teacher in um, living in Bedford-Stuyvesant in New York. And my mentor, who actually raised a child with a severe disability, who they thought would not live past a year, was a student at Yale when she had her child in the 80s. And she was a mentor. And she actually told me, on the weekends, when you get a chance, take the train and go to New Haven. Mm -hmm. So I did. And I fell in love. I stayed at the Holiday Inn. I went downtown New Haven. I like, you know, shopped at the little shops. I got Taylor. My daughter actually has a, a shirt that says Yale from when she, I mean, we don't still have it, but she had a picture of it with Santa Claus at her school for the deaf in Brooklyn, because that's how much I love Yale. I actually bought a shirt before I even had the degree from there. And this is way back in 2003. So my journey at, for Yale started so much sooner. So by the time I got there, after going to summer school in 2006 and taking an AFAM course and coming down from uh, Boston College, I really had a great time. It was, you know, at the Divinity School, well, one, they say the air is different up there. I don't know what that means, but I do know that we really had the opportunity to do faith meets intellect. And it was the interdisciplinary approach is something that I think should be like the grasp of everything corporate and um, higher ed. I was able to take classes at the law school, we were welcomed at the dining halls. So it was, it was, it was an amazing experience. Were there challenges? Yes, but not from the part of Yale. Um, I felt there were challenges for me as a mom and as a parent, and I was navigating the educational landscape, learning how to do like systematic theology at the Divinity School versus writing a paper for my ed courses for my master's program, completely different. Um, but yeah, I look forward to hearing the other questions you have. But overall, I, I had an amazing experience and Taylor felt welcome there. Yale Security loved us. And we really, really took advantage of all of the great opportunities from the library to everything at Yale. Well, when, when you speak of your time at Yale, I kept hearing the word we, we, we. Can you tell us a little bit more about the parenting part of your time at Yale. How old was Taylor during that time? How old were you at that time? Mm -hmm. How old, if, if you're willing to answer and, mm -hmm. and share about the gestation of your other baby, right? We, we mm -hmm. talked about this a little, mm -hmm. your other baby, My Good Life. Mm -hmm. And My Good Life is a book I can hold in my hand right now and I showed everyone, but your life and Taylor's life together really became 
from what from what I gather, and if you read when you read Arena's book, really the embodiment of that good life. So can you tell us a little bit about how you birthed that other baby, my good life, during those years at Yale, and how you're moving around New Haven and navigating the system for Taylor and navigating the system for you really made your experience at Yale that much more vibrant, that much more empowered, and that much more full of learning that wasn't part of the exact graduate degree program that you were on course for. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Yes, it, you know, honestly, the seed of my good life was birthed when I walked out the hospital with Taylor. Like I decided that I would have a good life despite the fact that I knew that she was hearing impaired. And I didn't know that there would be other um, disabilities, the autism, the um, diagnosis of the medical um, difference of epilepsy at the age of 17. I didn't know we would have other challenges, but I knew that having a hearing impaired child at 20 years old as a single parent when my parents lived in Florida was a bit much, but I decided when we walked out the hospital that we were going to have a good life. And I think even saying that in my spirit kind of helped the path of charting the course to make sure I made decisions that gave us that good life. So on Valentine's Day, um, this was 2010. <laughs> I was months away from graduating from, from Yale Dev, had had an amazing experience. I actually went to the J. Crew downtown. I bought myself the cutest tote. It was just a, a tote that had like an, an imprint of like someone shopping on it. I went back to my dorm room. I took a picture and this was way before influencer Instagram culture. <laughs> I took a picture of that tote on the floor and I wrote a blog. That was, I, I wrote a blog and I wrote about how despite being a mom and of a special needs child and being at, you know, in graduate school, I had a good life. Life was good. I had a sense of gratitude. And that is where the good life was birthed. I wrote every day for like a year on that blog. I'm sorry, every week, a blog on there. So it was 52 blogs for the year. And even after I graduated, it was just phenomenal. So before I knew it, I found myself living in downtown New Haven at 360 State, brand new swanky building at the time, so new you could smell the paint. <laughs> we had, everything was new. I lived on the seventh floor right above the swimming pool and I was connected to an amazing resale shop and a former Yale architect, um, you know, in downtown New Haven. And they took me to like a wine and cheese event of a storefront opening in downtown New Haven. And basically, they were giving away a grant, a very small grant, for you to create your own business. And I remember the city curator walking across the street with me as I'm talking to her and saying, well, I can do this. She's like, you're a Yaley. You'll figure it out. She said, well, if I give you the shop, the business, what would you do? I said, I would give people advice on next steps. I've always had to pivot in my life. And she said, well, what would you call it? And it literally came out like the good life, you know, and we got pressed in the New Haven Register for opening up the good life. Um, and so, yeah, from there, it was my brand for so many years. And I even wrote a blog for Chicago now that has about 20, you know, 200 blogs on them. Um, and the name is called the good life. So when it was time to write my book, I felt like I needed to own the good life and say my good life rather than just the good life. Speaking, speaking of the good life, you do in your book share, and it's hard to talk about this, but I think that people who are listening, some people have joined because they're connected to Yale. Some people have joined because perhaps they are parenting a child with special needs right now. Some people have joined because perhaps they did and they're processing what that experience has meant in their lives. Can you share, because I know when I, I read The Good Life, your good, your good life story. We mm -hmm. all could use some pointers and you have some key points without my getting out the book and, and going down the list. Cause I know I took notes cause there's some good ones there, Arena. Mm -hmm. If you could give us a sense of what you, what got you through that you could share with everyone listening tonight 
for those hard times because your smile is brilliant. Your your what you give to the world is incredible. I hope people will go and find some of these places where you've had these blogs and you have this track record of amazing stuff and your TEDx talk and and your Today Show posts and all of that. But there are some hard times. And I know behind that smile and behind your bright eyes, there's some tougher experiences. And if you could walk us through what you hold on to for pointers to get to your place of peace, to get to your place of pivoting, or to get to your place of, okay, here I am. I got here because of everything that came up to this moment. And what am I doing now? No, thank you so much for that. And you're right. I mean, the the challenges were real. The 3 a.m., you know, I had to actually go to sleep around nine to wake up at three to do my papers. You know, I had to send them off for extra editing because I was tired. You know, I was fatigued. You know, I spent the weekends making sure I was studying. I had to email post jail actually uh, you know, like the doctors weekly to get her cochlear implant upgraded, right? It was so many things that uh, were different for me and Taylor. But I think the thing that I, the first step, and I know we've all been through some tough times, you know, I had the the, the privilege of actually moderating um, a panel for, for Yale in the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> and I held space. You know, and I'll do that now. I'll hold space for people who are going through something that no one knows about. You know, we're technically in still some things, right? Um, Call it pandemic or not, there are still some things happening all over the world that are challenging, things that we're going through. And we've made decisions in the last two years that we've done the best that we could every single day. We've been challenged with that. And so the first thing that I would say is to forgive yourself. And I say that because I think like, you know, having a certain level of intellect, we tend to own stuff. If you were a basic level of a, have a basic emotional intelligence, you just own it. You're like, you know what? Some of this is me, or I could have done this different, or should I have done this different? Should I have gone that place? Should I have let this happen? Should I have bought that ticket? Should I have kept that job, right? And really, you have to just forgive yourself. And I think that is the number, that's the first step. The second step I say is to move on. And when I say move on, it doesn't mean like run out the door, you know, throw everything down or turn over the table or even walk off hotty, you know, like in a hotty fashion or send a bad email. Moving on is fluid. We're still doing it, right? We have the nerve to wake up every day, open our eyes and decide that we're gonna give it another go, right? And move on. And I think just deciding that daily or in in the action, the form of the action step that you need to is to say, just move on. And last but not least, you know, see the good. I think that's what the movement was all about. The book was all about. Of course, there was not a ton of easy stuff about our lives, but I felt like I wanted to see the good in our life so that I didn't have a sense of sadness, a sense of melancholy. You know, I was not always like so, so happy, right? Even now, it's a sense of responsibility to her next season and who she is and who she's going to become as a woman, right? And just when I think that all of the advocacy is done and people actually could get it right in 2022 to serve children with disabilities and adults with disabilities as she is now in the right way, I still find myself having to gently advocate, to be an advocate. And so seeing the good, seeing the privilege that I have to do that and the opportunity to do that is just, you know, so those, those are the three tips that I hope are helpful, even as we navigate every day, which still is kind of different. I just want some continuity. I just want easy, but who's to say that's fun, you know? Well, speaking from a place of, as, uh, as Wendy said, I was born with not not on the path of life is easy. Mm -hmm. And I'm more Taylor's person. And I feel for all that you've been through. 
having those guideposts about forgiving oneself and eventually getting to the step of, of moving on and then pivoting. It's so, so important. And I feel like when you shared each of those paths or parts of the path with me in our longer conversation, you spoke about how other people weave in and out of that process of getting to that path. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to hear more, if you're willing to share, about how people in the neighborhood, how your community, how your significant other, how your family fit in and wove into that. Because I know right now tonight, I feel one of the upsides of the pandemic, which there aren't that many, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been a really, really hard time. And the the level of loss and the level of pain and hardship is if you told all of us a few years ago, it's unfathomable, Mm -hmm. but choosing to get through it and choosing to connect and make these kind of connections. The one, the one blessing that I can hold on to is having evenings like this, where Mm -hmm. you're in the Carolinas. I'm here in New Jersey. I don't know. Maybe Kate will be able to tell us in the chat, how many people have logged in and joined this conversation For the world of people with disabilities, as you and I know, Zoom and Meet Mm -hmm. and all of these technologies have opened up the world to people with disabilities and their families and have opened up opportunities of communication. And and you and I have talked about how your neighborhood and your community were so important to you on your journey in your good life. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And I'd love to recognize that as hard as the world is, having the connections and and being blessed with meeting new people in our lives. Like I feel thankful to Wendy for inviting me to participate because I now get to feel like I know a little, I know a little bit more about you and you and I will connect. And that's what's interesting about the time that we're in and choosing the good every day. So Mm -hmm. tonight I'm choosing to be grateful that we can all connect and learn from you because I don't know that we could have all gotten to New Haven to do a talk that Wendy and her team might have hosted. But these programs now have changed the way we all interact. And there might even be people from around the world here. Mm -hmm. It's true. So how has that community and, and blending of all those parts of your lives worked for you in your good life as you continue your good life? Yeah, you know, it's been a game changer. Well, I'll give two examples. Um, one being more recent during the pandemic and the in the community, but from back in our time, um, not even at, at Yale was great for the community and you know the, the the Div School. The other students they saw Taylor, you know, as their like you know adopted niece or something, and they were just really kind. But you know, one of the communities that really spoke to me was in Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. It was like a utopia. And so it was just like an amazing space. And we had the local coffee shop and we had the local bookstore and they were just phenomenal. They really, really welcomed us and care for us, you know, and, you know, we even have celebrities that were not celebrities back then <laughs> that I would sit and have coffee with you know, the late Chad Bossman, you know, he, I have a picture Mm -hmm. with him from 2008. He had a shirt on, uh, an Obama shirt on, and I had like a blue dress on. And we're just sitting there, two kids, standing there, two kids on Lewis Ave. And he had just went out to Hollywood to try to make it as an actor, right? And he happened to be back in town. And then there was like the coffee shop owner who unfortunately passed away of COVID in 2020. And he was like an uncle to us. He was phenomenal. He would make sure that we had cakes and birthday parties. And I think community is so important. I think it's important to stay connected, to make the effort to be connected. I think virtually even, you'd be surprised. Like during the pandemic specifically, sometimes virtual was the only people that some people saw in order to make sure that they stayed accountable. One community that I loved was the education community for the Torrance Unified Public School District in California. I must tell you, without them, we would have never made it because they logged on every day and made sure they had an interpreter who was Taylor's interpreter for like the entire year to the point where we were remote 
somewhere else, let's just say, for a period of time. And he remained our interpreter till oh. the very, very end. He was phenomenal. Cute story. I get an email from a friend saying, hey, um, I see this audition for um, a hearing impaired, a deaf, you know, uh, you know, young person could would Taylor want to audition. I rushed and did Taylor's hair. I double strand twisted it. I printed out the, the script. It even has something like about your sister and no, and just an emotional, dramatic thing. I, I twisted her hair and she was like wondering, what's mom, what's going on? You're kind of rushing with this. I took up, took her picture, got the ring light set up and everything. And I actually got him on the interpreter and he gave us the lines to make sure we were doing them correctly. So we got to actually film an audition. It was one of the most fun days of our lives. This was last year. It was so cool. I mean, I love him tons. I'll have to text him when we get off. But I was so grateful. She was so happy. She just felt alive. She had the ring light. She had the camera on her. She's able to do it. And I'm feeding her her lines. And, and so again, community. You know, if there had never been an interpreter, if they had never differentiated instruction for her, if they just assumed that they can have a teacher's aide to sign to her versus an, an actual interpreter, ASL interpreter, it would have changed the game, you know? And so I have countless stories like that from her educators over the years. One who is in North Haven, who's actually retired now at the village school, who was phenomenal when I was at Yale. I had no problem like with my studies or Taylor at her school because she helped her with her adjustment, even differentiating instruction to the point where there was a timer on her wrist, the teacher. So if there was a negative behavior related to autism, every few minutes, she would give her what they call positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Good work, Taylor, so good, thank you. You know, and like just literally the timer on her. Can you imagine how many times she had to positively reinforce her in the whole six hour day? So I can go on and on about community, but I think it's important. I know it's important for children and adults with disabilities to have a community where people where they are accepted. And so I, I'm excited for that. Can you also tell me a little bit about your your personal life, your community of your your good life, you have Taylor, you have some other kids, you have a life partner, and that all factors in. I also want to hear a little bit about your neighbors and neighborhood. Um, for some of those times, and I don't want to keep harping on it, but I think it's so important. You shared some really intense lessons mm -hmm. on knowing that you had neighbors around, knowing that you had some check-ins. And I know you are now a person who does some of those check-ins on other people because of the impact on your own life. Yes. And to me, that really had an impact on my life of realizing that sometimes those things that those neighbors might've done for you, and I'll let you explain, Arena, but that, that neighbors around the community did for you and for Taylor, I don't know that they all knew unless they pick up the book and read it, <laughs> the impact that they had and what you're now doing in the world. When I, when I think of that pebble drop, right? You, yeah. They might've been a pebble to you with ripples. Now you're a pebble with ripples and Taylor's a pebble with ripples. And here we are. So can you share a little bit more about how sure. those neighbors impacted you? Definitely. I'll share a little bit about the neighbors and then I'll share a little bit about just my current good life and my, my partner and, and the girls, you know, um, and my bo awesome bonus sons. You know, neighbors are important. Um, it, you'd be surprised the true neighbors and family that we felt a lot of times were the businesses. So there was a restaurant in New Haven. So imagine we live alone. We lived alone, right? And so imagine you get done with your day. You want to go visit a friend or go visit someone. So in our apartment at 360 State, we had amazing neighbors upstairs. And every day I would make sure that like I was showered, the house was clean, everything was ready for them. So I can just hear about their awesome day, right? So it was kind of a mental check-in, but we had a business. We also had like the, the resale shop and the architect, right? That we connected with who ended up helping me get the, the uh, business across the street. 
but we had a soul food restaurant and I have to figure out that name and go in there and tell them how, excuse me, amazing they were. We had a resale shop that, um, I mean, I'm sorry, we had a, a restaurant that it was a soul food that had fried chicken and like yams and everything. I would pretend in my head that they were like our family so that I would go in and check in and eat and feel like I was sitting down at the dinner table with the family, you know, and it's those things you'd be surprised. People come into the same store every day, not because they want to spend their money, but because they see these people as family. So that goes out to people who are business owners, how you treat people, how you treat your customers. Your customers, a lot of times may see you as family. You may be a convenience for some, but really connection for others. But in my current life, I talk about it in the chapter of my Mr. Good Life. My mm-hmm. husband has been phenomenal. You know, the weekend that I prayed to God and said, I need help. I actually connected with him over the phone. We had knew each other from high school. And we talked that day forward because he was actually coming to New York to visit. And so he's been phenomenal. A great dad, not just a stepdad, but a father and a covering for us, you know, He's been so amazing and I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for him. I'm grateful for what he's done for us and how he's just, um, yeah, just been golden for our family. So we have three more girls. Uh, They almost look so much alike. And I also have bonus sons that live, uh, one lives across the country and one lives um, in Africa. So yeah, he's in the comments. He says, I'm truly the blessed one. He's on here now. So sweet, (laughs) sweet. (laughs) Well, bringing all that together, is there anything that you're working on right now that you can share with us beyond this book, beyond your life in North Carolina? Is there anything that, you know, you learned while at Yale and while at at your other universities, but you're taking into this next pivot? We'd love to hear a little bit about where my good life is going next. I know we're close to the the time where Wendy promised, we promised Wendy that we'd go to Q&A and we want to do that. But if you could share a little bit about where you think some of your next steps are? So honestly, you know, the thing that has been such a challenge in the past two months, psychologically, not just really tangibly, but it's tangible when you think about the work that goes into it, is transitioning Taylor. So Taylor is 22. The ages for a parent with a child with additional needs or disability, three, when they age out of early interventions, 18, when they now legally can be obtained by the state or anyone, they're legally an adult, and 22, when they are done with the school system. And 22 is upon us. Um, Those ages have been grieving times. I nearly wept at three and at 18 because it was a change. And so now I was faced a couple months ago with a panic. I was like, what will happen to her? And I felt an immediacy to get things in order and to make sure she has a life after where my friend's children are going off to college. You know, college may look different for her. I definitely want her to be a part of this digital transformation that's happening around the globe, like literally right now. You got to find out if you're over... 55, if your phone, your cell phone will work the same based on the way things are changing. I don't want my daughter with a disability or anyone who is has additional needs to be left behind the digital transformation age. So that's very important to me from a technology standpoint to make sure that websites are ADA compliant and that things are really um, just up to speed for her. So I took a breath and I decided you know what I'm going to do for Taylor? I'm going to give her my good life. Mm. So over the last decade, I've created this brand and I've built this brand big by brick. And when I say that, you know, I, it's under a 501c3. I have the book. Um, you know, I started kind of rallying up a community. I would give free dinners to moms and catering opportunities where like I would cater to them via Sephora makeovers. And I couldn't quite wrap my mind around what was next for my good life. So I had a sense of peace when I said I would give her my good life because when there were times, and I remember one distinctly, 
I was at Yale Summer School, 06, still at Boston College, but down to Yale for the summer because I insisted on going to Yale. So actually Boston College paid for me to take that course. We walked into our apartment. It was actually a sublet from a Yale law student down there right by the um, New Haven Hospital. So we stepped in my first time at Yale ever, like to like live there over the summer for the course. And I walked in and Taylor did something like she just like was kind of playing around. And I just kind of got like, oh, Taylor, like, oh, I'm just trying to like enjoy this moment of coming in. And there was the voice that really spoke to me in the spirit realm and said, she is your good life. There is no good life without her. She is. And so as I pass this brand down to her, you know, she'll be able to carry the torch around what a good life means for an adult with a disability and the mindset and the shift. And I can build that for her. So now all these ideas are coming to me about her coding course that I got her in through Girls Can Code. Shout out to Girls Can Code. I told them that she had special needs and they said, no problem. We can't wait for her to enroll which is so awesome because Black Girls Code, she actually built an app without code with a, with a, a peer last year. And so I'm grateful for that. I found her a really cool keyboard that's very colorful because it's external and that what she can write with. So that's what's next in that realm for Taylor specifically. And for me, I'm excited to enjoy my career. I waited 20 years to have a career and I love my job as a marketing communications manager um, for an ed tech company. I'm absolutely grateful for that. Like I, I built it from scratch and I'm grateful to be able to um, do what I do. So besides that, uh, checking me out on Instagram via Yale alumni, since I'm an Eli ambassador, you might even see the same sweatshirt that I film a video tonight. No, I'm kidding, but, um, <laughs> but I'm so grateful. So thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. And thank you for allowing me to just continue to share my story. Well, I have to thank you for sharing your story in my good life, for sharing a part of yourself tonight, for sharing some of Taylor's potential future. I can't wait to meet Taylor. I can't wait to meet you for real. But I think that Taylor is, is already, she's already won the lottery because she's got you in her corner. And I believe that some of the things you've shared about her future and your future together with her as she embarks on this next chapter is really bright. I know that you shared a lot about what the tech community is doing for people with disabilities and what the future may hold. And it's it's exciting stuff. So thank you so much, Arena, for sharing the, the ups and downs and for sharing some of your Yale insights and life beyond Yale. And I will definitely check out the Yale alumni Instagram community. And I will learn more about what your Eli Ambassador Program is all about. And Wendy, I think if you want to help us get some questions answered, I'll turn sure. it over to you. Sure, absolutely. Um, so uh, this is, I, I, I'm just, I, I'm loving this conversation and uh, I kind of don't want you to stop, but I also, we always, always, always ask our audience to participate in asking questions of our guests. And so um, I would like to invite everybody who is either listening or even on camera um, to ask Arena anything you might like to ask her at this point. Um, if you do have a question for her, um, you can raise your hand or you can type it into the chat. Um, uh, Janika, I hope I say your name correctly. Would you like to come on to camera and ask your question yourself or would you like me to read your question for you? Let me know. I'll give you a second. Okay. All right. Understood. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to read the question from the chat. So this is a question from Janika Beck McDavid. Um, thanks for being here. I have a child with special needs and I'm considering returning to a degree program at Yale. Can you give us any examples of how professors left space for you to be a parent or were you expected to be a student the same exact way as everyone else? Good question. Thanks a lot for that. You know, I think during that time, the good news is that like the professors were great. They were very understanding. Um, there was a rarity that I needed a deadline pushed or anything like that. I didn't do that. At that time, we were, a we were in a different time and space in terms of it being like 
what it was that at the end of the 2000s, you know, um, you just, as a woman of color, you just don't, you know, I was still reading uh, Condoleezza Rice's book twice as good <laughs> at that point. I had so much pressure on me during that time to do double. So I could not ask for favors. And in fact, it was the professors of color who were the hardest on me um, in some ways to make sure that I knew that we, we, you know, they, it was just interesting. But all that being said, um, I say, do it, go for it. But what I do say is to make sure to take um, advantage of the surrounding resources. There are some great schools, there's some great private schools and set up your community, you know? Church on the Rock was an amazing church. Shout out to the pastors there. And now I know the new pastors there who used to be the musicians, um, the, the music uh, leaders there. So they're phenomenal. There's also the Black Church at Yale. And then there's also the FM House. Um, what I can say about raising a child between three academic degrees is that I actually like to keep my home life and my school life a little bit separate in that I never, it's kind of like work, right? You know, you can do certain things, like you have the flexibility and you have a workforce that can understand, but I use that sparingly because what I didn't want is to let people into my private life. You know, there was always a schedule change. There was like, you know, there were those times, but I made do and I made sure to have childcare. In fact, one person I did not brag on was a young woman by the name of Caitlin. Caitlin, Caitlin, Caitlin. She was a Yale law student. She was my babysitter and she had a brother with autism, has a brother with autism. She is still to my friend to this day. And she is bad ass as I can swear at on Yale. <laughs> she is, she did Yale Law Review and now she is probably 30 seconds from partner at a LA law firm. Wow. And she actually bought my daughter, my by like eight year old now when she was six, her first dollhouse. And she actually started a philanthropic endeavor called Ella's Dollhouse because of the dollhouse Caitlin brought. One thing I didn't brag on is my Yale alumni family. When I tell you, and Wendy knows this <laughs> from seeing me over the years connect in every city I go to, Yale Day of Service, that's the one thing that I didn't get to talk about. Amazing. Amazing. I still shed tears over the two Eli's that I lost in the last two years because they were life changing friends. So I can tell you it's worth it to be at Yale as a graduate student because you get a family not just there, but later on. So it's completely doable. Build your community. Be honest with yourself about what you can and cannot do. But some of your community is right there. And like I said, she was in law school. What was she doing babysitting? First of all, what were we even doing? <laughs> what were we, like she would babysit for me and it was phenomenal. So it's totally doable. Thanks for asking the question, Janika. Thank you, Arena. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, lots of gratitude there. Um, so moving on, um, outstanding answer. Great, great question. Um, do I have anyone else who would like to ask Arena a question? And if I call on you, um, you know, you can kind of raise your hand. Uh, you can also type a question into the chat. I'd be happy to read it for you if you're shy or you can't come on camera. That's fine, too. Arena, where are you living right now? I, 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 I'm like, I keep following you around and, and you're I know kind of you got it. It's so hard. Where are you now? My, tell my us mom says it about her address book. She's like, you know what? I just gave up. I don't even try to write your address down. I'm in North Carolina. I'm in okay. North Carolina now. So yeah. Okay. And I'm so talk Wendy, to us about um, Wendy, I have a ton more questions if you want me to jump in. <laughs> I, I have I, I have a question for Raina, and then I know you have like you know, a whole ream of them. So I'll I'll yeah, we'll jump back to you. So Arena, um talk to us about um returning to the workforce, actually. I think that this mm. is something regardless of um, you know whether you have a child with special needs or not, um, you know, so many of us, and, and I would count myself in that crew, um, you have, uh, you start a family and then you, your, your work life looks different after that. Um, and then you decide to return to a full-time uh, place of employment. So talk to us a little bit about that transition and how that's been going for you um, as a professional, as a mom, um, and in this new age, because you have definitely embraced 
this world of technology and you have jumped in feet first. So talk to us a little bit about that. Thank you so much for that. I mean, to be honest, it was, it was a challenge. I mean, I had two master's degrees. It was like, it was, it did not matter. I had to get a a certificate, a tech certificate in order to get a role at a tech company. And so it was, it was a little bit challenging, but one thing I can say that I was very deliberate about my network, including Yale, about my BC network, about staying abreast, taking courses, Um, Yale has, this is not a plug at all. I do not get an extra sweatshirt for this, but (laughs) Yale has a plethora of free courses online and they have different partnerships with like Coursera that will help you kind of get up to speed on digital stuff. But um, yet and still, I can tell you, like I can't speak for all alumni, of course, but reaching out and connecting to people who are in the field and having the conversation has been key. And also just being honest with yourself about your skills and your assessment, seeing where you want to go, attending events that have to do with that sector, because then you become more confident. A lot of it is confidence. It's about Mm -hmm. how do I fit into this new conversation? So getting your resume together, getting back on LinkedIn, um, networking with your peers, and then jumping out there and going for the job search. And being honest about what you can and cannot do in terms of like your um, your ability to like work long hours if you want to be in person or um, work remote. So, but I've had a lot of fun connecting even before I went back in with the realm that I wanted to be in. So I just I wasn't shy about learning. I wasn't shy about attending events. So, so yeah, I think you have a question. You were right now. Uh, Gary. Hey, Wendy, it's good to see you again. Likewise, uh, uh, Gary and I were in an event earlier this morning. <laughs> One time I know, that's the <laughs> for you. You're like, I saw you just. Yeah, yeah, we're, do- we're doing it. Um, now, I wanted to say, for one, uh, Arena, you are inspirational. And as a person who also has a uh, kid that has special needs, my son has epilepsy. I think that hearing your story is inspiring to others who want to to go to graduate school, to be able to do these things in spite of people saying that having special needs children are obstacles. I, for one, am in the same line of thinking as you is like, it's a blessing and it makes you have more empathy and grace. And you always share yourself with the world. I mean, like your kid, I'd be jealous if I was your kid. Arena (laughs) is one of those people who shares herself with the world, shares herself with the Yale community, shares herself with the communities that she's in. And I think that um, you don't give yourself enough credit. So I'm going to give you your flowers now and say thank, thank you, you so much you. for being the person you are, because I think you're amazing, amazing, amazing and inspirational. And so uh, I am glad that you're sharing yourself with us again tonight. Uh, it's, just, it's amazing. And, and I'm sorry that I'm late. I, I'm doing meeting to meeting to meeting. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate He's an Eli ambassador, by the way. So just so you also know, an Eli you, ambassador. Gotta go you gotta go to that Instagram page. You gotta go to that Instagram. Page. Yep. <laughs> if you go to the Instagram page, you will see Arena is the very first thumbnail there. And I also, um, you know, I'm going to also give Arena a shout out on a couple of things. Um, I would recommend that you go, uh, you Google her TEDx uh, talk, which is uh, really wonderful. Um, and also, um, Arena uh, was somebody that kind of immediately came to mind when we were doing the Celebration of Women at Yale a couple of years ago. And I really wanted Gretchen Rubin of the mm-hmm. Happiness Project um, to come in and speak for our, uh, for our celebration. And Gretchen graciously agreed. And then it was a question of, okay, who do I get to interview Gretchen Rubin? <laughs> Lots on the line, right? Because she's a best-selling author several times over. Um, and I was racking my brains like, who's the right person to interview Gretchen? And the right person was Arena Ferguson. <laughs> we had a and good she time. Did a fabulous too. job. And you can look that uh, interview up on the YA Vimeo channel, as well as if you go to celebratewomen.yale.edu, um, you can look in the events there and see the recording. Um, you did a fabulous job, Arena, and, and Gretchen was delighted with you. And, and you did a wonderful job with that interview. So I just want to thank you for, for that. And <laughs> Throw some additional flowers your way. So <laughs> Tammy, uh, sure. So Tammy, uh, questions. 
Well, Gary brings up a uh, brings up the point of an, another parent as another parent joining in with a child with special needs. I know that there were some moments that Arena shared with me, and and she shares some in her book about. And this might be something that Janika wants to jump in with as well, and others here. That Taylor is really lucky because she has Arena in her corner, and Arena has worked her whole life and Taylor's life on making sure that her IEP meets her daughter's needs, making sure that her IEP is actually followed. I know that I it really resonated with me when Arena speaks in her book about meeting some educators who weren't necessarily ready to follow the IEP. And I'd love to have Arena talk with us about how her own background as an educator dovetailed with her background as a parent of a child with special needs and dovetailed with her knowledge as an advocate of what was due for her daughter to get the education that the law provides. And I'm sure that we can all learn from some of her bulldog skills, <laughs> even before she was a bulldog, to get what she knew her daughter needed and deserved. That's an excellent question. Excellent. Thank question. you. Thank you so much, Tammy. Now you rock, Tammy. You know, I want you all to myself, all to myself to have an amazing up here. But yeah, so so yeah, you know, honestly, when I think back, it was funny. I'm picturing the first time I was at a table. They never tell you at an IEP meeting, they're gonna have 10 people there to your one. And so I remember the first table I was at, it was a long table. It was New York City Public Schools. And it was like in their boardroom and I was faced with all these men and women in suits. But guess what I had on? I'm telling you, Taylor and I used to go up to campus in 03. <laughs> I actually had on the baseball version of like a Yale shirt and a blazer, the same little one that Taylor had. But anyway, but I, that was the very first one, I needed to go in there and be confident, right? This was like six years before, um, five years before I was at Yale. But I would be very deliberate about not being too emotional and stating the law over and over again and reminding them of that and just reminding them that there were needs that need to be met. And that as the parent, I, I knew a lot about her needs because I understood her day-to-day -day interactions. I honestly, again, I'm so excited for this generation. I'm so excited for the, though there was so much pain in the last four to five years around race relations in our country, I do believe that in a lot of ways we turned a corner. And here's why. Back in that day, I had to be 95% of everything. So I had to print everything out. I was afraid of this. I was afraid of that. I couldn't even jaywalk because I was afraid they would take my child. Like I was just very particular. It was so much pressure on me to have a certain level of excellence and deliberate. So there was no way they were going to beat me. I was always one step ahead of them. But I think it was mostly because I knew the law. And I expressed my needs and wants, and I knew how to escalate it if I need to. And I knew how to politic a little bit. You know, I knew how to just remind them of what my next steps might be. And that let's just settle this now because we're a team. And you truly are a team. I can say this. You want your relationship with the schools to be less adversarial because once you get on that side of they're afraid of you or they're gonna see you being emotional, they won't listen. You have to reason with them and almost use this language. If this were your child, what would you do? If we were not in this room, if this was off the record, what advice would you give me? If I was your sister or your mother, how would you connect with me in this? You find yourself one person, Texas, 2016, if you could picture it. Don't even ask why. I had one year, one year of my life off the grid. And we were in Texas. And I will never forget, I was very nice, very cordial, very deliberate. But I told a woman, I need a white woman to go in there with me. <laughs> and I need you. She was one of the administrators. You are my person. You don't get to be on that side, you're on my side. Because if I say it, so I'm gonna write for you, tell you what to say, and you're gonna say it on my behalf 
so that the whole team can win. Because if I say it, they're going to see it a certain way. And so, and this was just 2016, <laughs> like that was just yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately you have to be strategic and post COVID, post what we've all been through, to be honest, just build it how you want to see built. Stop asking people for extra stuff. Don't do that anymore. Go ahead and take your child where they're wanted. Try to make the best decisions and breathe into your reality and your life. And do not, under no circumstances, treat it like it's pre-2020. You can have a remote life. You want to make money. You want to be safe. You want to be on the grid to some degree. But really think out the box on what you wanted. And as my awesome husband would say, think with the end in mind and work your way backwards. Do not insist on going a route that someone else wants for you. That's my advice. Fabulous. I, I like write down every step. I want to get my post-it <laughs> notes out. I want to sit with you and Jason on the floor and I want to see where those post-it <laughs> notes go. You'll know what I mean when you read the book. You got to read the book for that one. You got to read the book. Okay. If you want to know about the post-it notes, you got to read the book. <laughs> okay. So, so you, so everybody, I, I think we could be here all evening with Arena, um, if we wanted to. One quick question, Arena: If we wanted to purchase your book, what's the best way to do it? Honestly, this is not a book plug. Uh, uh, this is not a show intended to plug her book. This is FYI, this is yeah. yeah. I'm just curious. Oh, no problem, no problem. They can actually go to Amazon and type in "My Good Life," Irena Ferguson. <laughs> And if they want to like find my name or like they somehow miss out on my name, they can just go to uh, the Yale alumni um, page and just kind of scroll down. And my hair is a little different. It's in twist in one of the pictures. I think what is the Afro? Who knew? But this is the same. I don't know if I'm going <laughs> to wear this every time, but these letters are the same on my shirt. You can find me on there. But yes, definitely. Okay. If you go to Amazon, you can type in my good life book, any Raina Ferguson, and it'll come up. But, um, but just, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Thank you again for always getting me, giving me the opportunity to share my story or participate in amazing alumni events. I can't tell you what Yale means to me, so. That's, well, Arena, I think Yale is a huge fan of you right, right on back, right? Um, mm -hmm. We love you too. And I think that you have really touched a lot of people in the Yale community, which is why, um, you know, we, we keep kind of, you know, re-engaging you for things. Um, and so with that, um, I want to just kind of uh, wrap things up here tonight. I wanted to thank all of you for participating in tonight's session and um, for being so engaged with Arena. I would like to thank Arena herself um, for joining this evening and, and sharing such her, her honest story. Thank very you. real story. I would like to thank Tammy, thank who uh, agreed to moderate tonight's session. Uh, it was a little bit tight in terms of timing, um, but I really felt, Tammy, that you would be the best person to, to lead this conversation, and I'm so happy that you did. So thank you for coming out of retirement. <laughs> thank you <laughs> so this. much. This is not the last you'll see, Tammy. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. And, and I just want to say, um, as we close here, I, I, this, um, you know, disability is something that I, I would like us to talk about more in the Yelp community, mm -hmm. right? Um, because we can, anybody can become um, disabled at any point in their lives. Um, and once you kind of start peeling it back, it's actually uh, everywhere, right? So I would like more opportunities for us to talk about um, themes of disability in all of our lives um, and how it, it touches us, right? So if you do have ideas on that topic, please let me know. Um, the Board of Governors and the YAA does care very much about this topic. So we're here um, to, to do more on this, right? Um, so last thing is uh, there will be a recording posted of this session on Vimeo as well as on our YouTube channel, I believe. Um, and then uh, there will be a, a show next week. I can't remember exactly what the theme is um, for next week. And then the 31st, we're doing an event on uh, female athletes. It's Women's History Month. Um, so we are going to be inviting uh, some star athletes from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, as well as some current students to talk about women's athletics at Yale and how it's changed over the years um, in honor of Women's History Month. So regardless of whether you're an athlete or not, I did intramurals, 
I didn't do varsity sports. It's going to be an amazing session. So that will be the 31st at eight o'clock. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And with that, we will let you go. Have a great night, everybody.